My name is Betty, and for years my world had been the endless corridors and bustling terminals of the airport. I thought I knew every secret, every hidden corner where lost items and forgotten stories gathered dust as I ran my mop through the gigantic international airport, but nothing could have prepared me for the mystery that began to unfold one quiet night shift. It started with a note, tucked beneath a bench in Terminal B. Written in a hurried scrawl, it read, They never landed because they never left. It was nonsensical, yet something about it unnerved me. I pocketed the note, telling myself that it was just a prank, but curiosity had already taken root in my mind. Over the following weeks, more notes appeared, each more perplexing than the last. Flight 440 is a lie, one declared, hidden inside a restroom stall. Another, found beneath a tray table in the food court, warned, Beware the ghost gates. These messages scattered like breadcrumbs throughout the airport, hinted at something beyond the edges of my understanding. Driven by a need to make sense of these cryptic warnings and a lot of boredom at my job, I began to piece together a timeline, cross-referencing the notes with old flight schedules and airport records that I could find online. Flight 440, as it turned out, was a flight that had mysteriously vanished from schedules years ago, a flight the airport administration and operator claimed had been cancelled permanently due to operational issues. Then, one night, as I was cleaning an old storage closet for supplies, I stumbled upon a sealed box labeled Flight 440. My heart raced as I cut through the tape, revealing a trove of personal effects watches, wallets, even children's toys. It was as if the passengers had simply vanished, leaving everything behind. I decided to confront Jerry, the night shift manager, someone who had been at the airport as long as I had, if not longer. Jerry, have you ever heard about Flight 440? I asked him one night, trying to sound casual. Jerry's face went pale, his usual easygoing demeanor replaced by a tight-lipped tension. Betty, some stones are better left unturned, he replied, his voice barely above a whisper. Trust me, you don't want to dig into the past. But his warning only fueled my determination. I knew then that there was truth to be found, buried deep beneath layers of secrecy and fear. The notes were not mere pranks. They were desperate messages. My investigation led me to a retired pilot, Captain Harris, who had supposedly flown the last known flight of 440. He met me at a rundown bar near the airport, a shell of a man he once was, haunted by memories he couldn't escape. Captain Harris, I need to know about Flight 440. I said, quick to cut through the pleasantries. What happened to it? He looked at me. His eyes clouded with grief and something darker, a burden too heavy for one soul to bear. After a long pause, he spoke, his voice a hoarse whisper. I never flew Flight 440. I was told to be quiet when I started poking and soon declared unfit to fly. I did my own digging, but someone attempted to kill my daughter and I had to stop. All that I know is that it was hidden locked away in a hangar that you won't find on any map. The passengers, they they became part of something, something terrible. His words sent shivers down my spine, a confirmation of my worst fears. But I had so many questions. I realized I was uncovering a conspiracy that went beyond anything I had imagined. The deeper I dug, the more the airport felt like a facade, a stage set up for a play where the actors didn't know the script. The notes continued to appear, the latest one saying Hangar 13 doesn't exist. I couldn't escape the feeling that someone was watching me, guiding my steps. But who? Determined to find the truth, I decided to take a risk. Late one night, I made my way to the hangar area after stealing a pass of a colleague who did day shift there. Now, the blueprints didn't show a Hangar 13, which I thought was a superstitious numbering issue, but before my eyes, I saw the massive structure. As I approached, the air felt charged, the silence oppressive. The hangar, dilapidated and seemingly abandoned, loomed over me like a tomb far away from the main airport. I unlocked the door, my hands trembling, and stepped inside. 
What I found was beyond comprehension. The hangar was filled with items from Flight 440, seats arranged in eerie rows, luggage stacked neatly at one end, and at the center of it was a cockpit simulator, surrounded by monitors displaying looping footage of a flight taking off but never landing. I heard footsteps and turned to see Jerry standing at the hangar entrance, his expression one of resigned sorrow. I knew you'd find your way here, he said, his voice heavy. You always were too curious for your own good. Jerry, what is this place? What happened to Flight 440? I demanded, my voice echoing in the vast emptiness of the hangar. He sighed, a deep, soul-weary sound. (sighs) Flight 440 was a government experiment, Betty. An experiment in fear and human psychology. The passengers were subjects, unknowing participants in a study on the effects of perpetual flight, of a journey with no destination. I felt my stomach churn, the horror of his words sinking in. But why? How could anyone do something so... so monstrous? Cold War made us do things. It was supposed to be a breakthrough in understanding fear and its impact on the human psyche, Jerry explained, his eyes hollow. But it went too far. The project was shut down, the flight erased from records. Only a few of us know the truth. And the passengers? I whispered, afraid of the answer. Lost. Lost to a nightmare of our making. Glad you found the truth. If only a janitor could break the news and bring an end to this cycle. The weight of the revelation crushed me. The notes, the hidden messages. It was Jerry who was behind everything from the start, who couldn't risk his life, but through an unassuming janitor he could finally bring this story to light. In the following weeks, the scandal broke. Investigations were launched, careers ruined, and the government pinned the blame on the airport's administration. Anger 13 was exposed. It eventually came out that a few passengers of the original Flight 440 were still alive, mentally gone, declared missing from their families, but kept alive. They were brought to the simulation from time to time as a few twisted scientists still studied them. The only good thing that came out of it was that the families who had lost their loved ones decades ago finally got to meet them. Even though their brains were fried, as one of the newspapers reported it, at least the families could finally get answers to their miseries. Jerry was arrested as well. I was called to his hearing, and even though I convinced the world how without him the entire conspiracy couldn't be revealed, the government threw him under the bus. It hurt me that some of the sick minds who had started the experiment got away with less time due to their old age and connections as they kept their mouths shut and saved the masterminds. But Jerry, the poor man, was sentenced for life. It says a lot about the fractured world we live in, I guess. My name is Professor Brandon Anderson, and I have always considered myself adept at navigating the complex corridors of the human mind. However, nothing in my extensive career as a psychologist had prepared me for the perplexing series of events that unfolded during what should have been a routine trip to an international psychology conference. The day started ordinarily enough, with the hustle and bustle of the airport. It was only when I approached the check-in counter that the first thread began to unravel. The attendant, a young man with an otherwise professional demeanor, paused mid-sentence, his gaze fixed on a point over my shoulder, a look of sheer panic flitting across his face before he snapped back to reality, offering no explanation for the bizarre interruption. Puzzled but pressed for time, I proceeded to security, where the oddities multiplied. The security officer, while patting me down, whispered frantically, Do you see him too? Before abruptly walking away, as if our exchange had never happened. By the time I reached my gate, seated, waiting for my flight, I observed my fellow passengers. A woman seated across from me was engaged in a heated conversation on her phone, but as I looked closer, I realized that it was a toy phone. I approached her, my professional intrigue getting the better of me. Excuse me, ma'am, are you having trouble with your phone? 
I asked, aiming for a tone of casual concern. She blinked at me, confusion evident in her expression before a slow smile crept onto her face. Oh, no, I'm just practicing for a play. You see, I'm an actress. She explained, though her answer did little to alleviate some unease within me. Attempting to shake off the feeling, I decided to grab a coffee. That's when I met Tom, a barista whose behavior added another layer of mystery to the day. As he handed me my coffee, his hand trembled violently, spilling some of the drink. Everything okay, Tom? He glanced around nervously before leaning closer, lowering his voice to a conspiratorial whisper. It's all a test, isn't it? I I mean, how can all of this be real? He muttered, a manic glint in his eyes that I had seen in patients during delusional episodes. His words sent a chill down my spine. A test? His notion began to weave itself into the fabric of my observations, forming a pattern I couldn't yet understand. As I walked away, my coffee forgotten, I overheard snippets of conversations, each more disjointed and nonsensical than the last. A man arguing about the impossibility of the time on his watch, a child asking her mother why everyone was pretending to be someone else, and a group of teens laughing about how none of it mattered because we'll just wake up from it. With each step, the atmosphere thickened with an unspoken tension, a collective unease that seemed to echo my growing suspicion that something was profoundly amiss. This couldn't merely be a coincidence or a series of unrelated oddities. My mind raced through possible explanations. Mass hysteria, a shared psychotic disorder, or perhaps, as Tom the barista had suggested, a test of some sort. But who would orchestrate such a thing? And to what end? And more importantly, why did I feel like the only one aware of the absurdity unfolding around me? Determined to find answers, I decided to confront the situation head-on. My first step was to gather more evidence, to engage with others and confirm that I was not alone in my perceptions. The deeper I delved into my peculiarities surrounding me, the more the airport felt like a stage set for an elaborate play, with each participant unknowingly playing their part. My resolve to unearth the truth about this charade led me to initiate more conversations, each interaction threading a needle through the fabric of a reality that seemed increasingly warped. I approached the security guard again, hoping to glean insight in the day's events. Have you noticed anything unusual today? Anything at all? I inquired, my tone deliberately even. The guard eyed me for a moment, his expression unreadable. Then, with a sigh, he confided. You wouldn't believe the things I've seen. People walking through the walls, luggage moving on its own. But but every time I try to report it, uh, the incident, it just vanishes from the cameras. His voice trailed off, a mixture of fear and resignation in his words. This confession was the most unsettling yet. It suggested not mere psychological anomalies among individuals, but a distortion of reality itself. My mind, trained to seek rational explanations, struggled to comprehend it. As boarding time neared, a sense of urgency propelled me forward. I found myself standing, watching the crowd, when a sudden announcement over the PA system caught my attention. Brandon, it's time to wake up. Surprised to hear my name, I made my way to the desk, where I was greeted not by an airline employee, but by Dr. Amelia Mara, a colleague and friend from the university where I taught. Her presence was both a shock and a relief. Amelia, what are you doing here? I asked, bewildered. She smiled, a knowing look in her eyes that immediately unsettled me. This airport, the people, the bizarre events you've been witnessing, it's all been a carefully constructed simulation, Brandon. We're not really here. Wake up? Uh, Amelia, what are you talking about? Uh, What's going on here? My confusion mounted with her cryptic words. She took a deep breath before continuing. You've been a part of a groundbreaking virtual reality therapy session, Brandon. After the accident, you were left with severe trauma and acute paranoia. Her words only deepened my bewilderment. 
Uh, simulation? But what are you talking about? After the accident, you were left with severe trauma and acute paranoia. We created this scenario to help you confront and overcome your fears in a controlled environment. Amelia explained, her voice calm and reassuring. The revelation hit me like a physical blow. Memories I had locked away began to surface. The accident at the airport two years ago, the loss of my wife, the subsequent descent into a paranoia so profound did it threaten to consume me. As the realization settled in, the airport around me began to dissolve, the simulation glitching and fading away to reveal the stark walls of the therapy room where I had been sitting, virtual reality equipment attached to my head. Amelia was there, real this time, along with a team of therapists who had been monitoring the session. The twist of reality, the realization was overwhelming and tears dripped from my eyes. Yet, as the initial shock waned, a profound sense of gratitude took its place. The bizarre behaviors, the erratic events, even the conversations with Tom and the others were all facets of my psyche the program had used to guide me toward healing. In that moment, as I reacquainted myself with the reality untainted by the distortions of trauma and paranoia, I understood the true depth of the human mind's capacity for both illusion and recovery. The therapy, as unconventional as it was, had offered me a doorway out of the maze of my own fears, back into a world where airports were just airports, and the people within them were just people. And though I stepped out of the therapy center that day with a heart still heavy with loss, I also stepped out with a newfound strength. A clarity of mind I had thought forever lost. The experiment, my journey through a simulated reality, had ended, but my true journey toward healing had just begun.